So we're going to be talking today a little bit about voice science, vocal pedagogy, looking at some scientific studies. But the way we've arranged this session is actually sort of a high-speed tag team session. Uh, we have four topics that we're going to cover today. And so we are going to be talking very fast. And uh, that's not because we're nervous. It's because we have a lot of information we want to get to you uh, in a short amount of time. The goal of this is just to give you a taste of the kind of literature and the kind of resources that are out there for you as choral conductors in voice science and pedagogy that make a direct application to what you do in your choral rehearsal. So we're getting now to, into the perceptual implications of those. And the rule number one to, to understand with vibrato is that the perceived pitch of a tone produced with vibrato relates to the average frequency of the undulation. Fortunately, our minds do this for us. If I want to sing A3, I sing A3, and I sing it with vibrato, and my voice is going above and below and above and below, but mine says, uh-uh, it's A3. Okay, that's, that, that, that's what we're hearing. But the problem gets into this, that if I'm singing A3 with a 6% frequency modulation, that 220 hertz is varying 13.2 up and 13.2 down. Well, A sharp is 233 and G sharp is 207. So my undulation here in the lowest of that modulation is going A3, A sharp, A3, G sharp, A, A sharp, and, and back through. So you can see there the issue of, of intonation, particularly for us as, as, as choral conductors and trying to fashion a, an intonation system and a way for the choir to tune when it's kind of a moving target. And in fact, that's what uh, Sundberg says about it, is, and, and he actually turns it into something that he feels is a good thing, and that vibrato allows singers to vary the size of the consonant intervals without producing beats. Basically, he's saying the singers can widen the target by having vibrato in, in effect there. So we have to talk about flow and resistance. The breath flows because of what we do with our musculature, but we have to adopt some kind of laryngeal resistance in order to get the sound that we want. So let's talk a little bit about the, the mechanism of breathing. When we breathe in, we have a set of muscles that help us do that. The inspiratory muscles, the most important one that we talk about, is the diaphragm. And let me say that again. The diaphragm is a muscle of inspiration. This is a myth that has been largely dispelled, and I hope you all know this. I'm sure you probably do. But the diaphragm contracts when we breathe in, and it pushes our things inside our guts here out of the way, and it creates a vacuum and pulls the air into the lungs. So the diaphragm is one of the important muscles, and the external intercostal muscles are another set of muscles that are important. Those are attached to the rib cage on the outside, and they lift and separate the ribs, kind of like bellows. They pull the ribs apart, which in turn pulls your lungs apart, which in turn draws air into the lungs. Simple. Basic physics. So for expiration, we use the internal intercostals, which again are rib cage muscles that contract the rib cage like a bellows and pushes the air out. We also use the abdominal muscles, which contract and draw in and do th have the same effect. And then we also have a set of muscles called the obliques on the side, which help to do the same thing. There are other muscles that are involved, these are the primary ones. So that's sort of the mechanism uh, as far as the musculature is concerned. But let me remind you again what's happening laryngeally. Here we have the glottal closure opening, that's uh, the breathing posture. We talked about that in the last session. We have loose glottal closure, where the arytenoids come together but they're not firmly adducted. We have firm glottal closure with the LCA muscles helping us out there. And then we have that posterior glottal chink, which happens in a lot of young singers. Remember the study we talked about earlier with young women, 76% of the young women who did not sing with good glottal closure during soft singing. So we have a good contingent of people who are not using a good glottal posture when they are singing, which means no matter how much you tell them to engage that breath support, to breathe low and em engage the musculature, it's still gonna sound ah, because they're letting too much air escape at the, at the nozzle of the hose. We need to put a proverbial thumb over that. Oh, here's Brian. Tag team again. We as choral conductors have our bag of tricks. And in our bag of tricks are our sayings, our slogans, our tricks for managing certain situations. And several years ago I was judging a festival 
and I happened to be there early, and one of the choirs was warming up on stage, and the director was trying to get the group to essentially sing louder, I, I think that's, that, that was his approach. So at first he asked for forte, and didn't get quite the result that he was looking for. Then he said, well, no, don't sing louder, just project. Um, and you know, I was sitting in the back, and I didn't hear really any noticeable difference in the sound. And they said, all right, ring in the ears of the person seated in the back row of the theater. And I was the one sitting in the back row of the theater. Um, and the sound didn't really ring in my ears either. Um, and I got to thinking, well, what does that mean? If I were in his choir, what would I do with this don't sing louder, just project? What would I do with this ring in the ears of the person seated in the back row. And I think my first inclination, especially as a younger singer, would have been just to try to sing louder. And that leads to this Lombard effect, where a singer tends to increase vocal intensity as the intensity of the choir increases. We've heard this. It results in over singing, and in some cases screaming in the choir. And this just does nothing but fatigue the choir, cause bad intonation, and just develops unhealthy vocal habits. Now, the problem is not in the intent. I think his intent was good in that he wanted a perceived difference in the volume of the choir, and that, that was fine. I think the, the error of the ways was in the manner of the approach, in that it was not specific for the choir. It did not give specific instructions for what to do. Now, I also got to thinking, well, how can we as conductors then, what if we didn't have to use this kind of ambiguous uh, language? And what if we didn't have to use language at all? Can't, aren't there some things we can do? Aren't there some things that acoustics can tell us? And yes, there are. We have the study of choral acoustics, which is a relatively new field in, in the area of voice science and pedagogy, um, the studies of what's going on in choirs and the acoustical spectrum created by the choir. But certainly in our bag of tricks, we know at least the first one of these is the voice matching principle popularized by Weston Noble. And there's also a lot of research done by James Daugherty, who's doing a con uh, competing session right now. Um, but I do encourage you to read his, his research on this, because it really is quite extraordinary. I'm going to uh, synthesize it down into like three sentences, but that does not nearly do it justice. Um, it, it's, it's some really good work here.